Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Welcome back to our conference, the APDA Virtual Parkinson's Conference, Educate, Empower, and Engage. Hi, I'm Leslie Chambers, President and CEO of the American Parkinson Disease Association, or APDA for short. To those of you who were with us yesterday, welcome back. And if you're just joining today for the first time, we are happy to have you. And don't worry because yesterday's sessions were recorded so you'll be able to go back and catch up on anything you missed. It's been so exciting to see where everyone is joining us from. Please put your name and location in the chat so we can see all of the many towns, cities, and countries represented again today. As I mentioned yesterday, APDA is headquartered on Staten Island, New York, and today I'm joining you from Wilton, Connecticut. So let's see who is joining us today and where you're from. Well, welcome to Lazaro from South Texas, Peggy from St. Paul, Mike from California. Hey, Catherine from Virginia, Janet from Oregon, John from Hawaii, Paul in Delaware, Robin in California, Mike from Virginia, and Philip from Northeast Florida, just to name a few. Welcome again, and it's so great to see all the exciting and wonderful places that you're all coming from. So we have another fantastic day of presentations lined up for you today, from learning about the exciting possibilities of stem cell research for Parkinson's disease and the benefits of cognitive behavior therapy, to an open and honest panel discussion with care partners, as well as tips for those who are newly diagnosed and just trying to figure out what to do next. And this is just a sampling of the day's programs. Please review the agenda from start to finish because we have two sets of concurrent sessions today. So you can choose the sessions and topics that interest you the most. We know it might be hard to decide, but remember, we will record all of today's sessions so you can eventually watch them all. So no matter which sessions you choose or whether you participated in just one session from this conference or you sat in on every single one, the main takeaway we'd like you to have is that APDA is here for you. We are all here for you. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter where you are on your Parkinson's disease journey. We want to help to support you, inform you, and empower you to live your best life despite Parkinson's. We know that when you're going through something as challenging as a chronic illness like PD, it might make sense that you would look at others and think, well, you know, they don't really understand what it's like for me. But on a personal note, I'd like you to know that I do understand. Parkinson's disease has directly impacted my family as well, since my younger brother was diagnosed in 2014, ironically two years into my tenure here at APDA. So not only is Parkinson's disease the focus of my work life as president of this amazing organization, it's now firmly rooted in my personal life and a part of my family as well. So remember, we care and we are here for you. This conference is just one of the ways APDA is here to support you. We'd love to know if you've participated in any other APDA programs, or maybe this conference is your first. So we're going to try a polling question. When the box comes up on your screen, please tell us which of the APDA programs you've participated in before, and you can choose all that apply. Included in the list are the optimism walks, both in-person and virtual support groups, as well as in-person and virtual exercise classes, in-person educational programs, our Dr. Gilbert hosts webinars, let's keep moving webinars, and or just let us know if this is the first APDA program you're participating in. So we'll take a minute to tally those results and get back to you in a moment. In the meantime, I'd like to thank our very generous sponsor, Acadia Pharmaceuticals, and also the Simone Charitable Foundation, who provided support for this event. We truly appreciate their partnership, and we appreciate your partnership. So many of you have donated to APDA over the years, and many of you have donate, donated when you registered for this conference. So I'd like you to know that we really appreciate that support. It helps us to do the important work that we do every day.
Okay, so we have the results and we are really excited and glad to see so many first timers with us. So welcome to the APDA family. And it looks like many of you have been enjoying our Dr. Gilbert host webinars. Some of you have been to our optimism walks. That's fantastic. So we'll put the links in the, of the walks in the bio so you can see if there's one near you. We hope you will participate. Uh, it's really a super fun event and it's a great way to be involved with the Parkinson's community. We're going to ask you some other questions throughout the day. After each presentation, there will be just a couple of questions about the particular session, and we hope you'll take time to share your thoughts. It only takes a minute, and it will help us create future programs that serve you best. There will also be a more in-depth survey at the end of the day. I personally want to thank you in advance for sharing your feedback with us, because it really helps us plan future programs designed for you. Before I go, just a reminder that every activity and interaction you complete on the Whova platform for the conference earns you points, and we have some fun prizes for the winners. So get involved and get active for a chance to win a gift card or some cool APDA prize packs. You can post a question in the Q&A, post an icebreaker in the community message board. There are lots of ways to earn points. All these add up. We'll put our community agreements in the chat now and ask that you please review those to help us maintain a positive and supportive environment for all for this conference. All right, folks, it's just about time to get started with our first presentation. I'd like to introduce Rosa Pena, APDA's Vice President of Programs and Services, who will kick things off and introduce our first special guest of the day. Rosa, the mic is yours. Thank you, Leslie, and welcome again, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this session entitled Top 10 Tips for Care Partners with our special guest, Sheila Moore. Sheila is a licensed clinical social worker and has worked in the field since 1988. She is part of the multidisciplinary team providing psychosocial services in a patient-centered care environment at Pacific Neuroscience Institute in California. Sheila provides support and education to patients and their families, increasing their ability to cope and regain a sense of control. In addition, Sheila is the Information and Referral Coordinator for APDA in collaboration with the Pacific Movement Disorder Center. She connects people with PD and their care partners with community resources and hosts with the team at PMDC Education and Support Programs. We are honored to have Sheila with us today, and she'll answer questions live after her presentation. So be sure to include your questions in the chat. Sheila, the floor is yours. Oh, Rosa, thank you so much. Thank you for the lovely introduction. And thank you especially for the invitation to be here this morning. Um, I uh, am, am thrilled and honored and want to welcome all of you who are attending today. And I want to especially give a warm um, welcome to the care partners who are joining in. Um, I'm hoping that at the end of our session today that there will be tips that you can take away with you. Um, and even more importantly, I'm hoping that you'll see this as an invitation from all of us to um, uh, an invitation for self-care. And so um, I, I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about the definition of partner. Um, the the um, path, oh, the, thank you, thanks, sorry about that. Um, the uh, as part of my um, my own self-care journey, I have various teachers who will often encourage me to look up words that I think I'm familiar with, with the idea of maybe getting a different perspective to find if it's the right fit. And so I thought that since we were spending some time reflecting on the idea of care and the idea of partner, that we take a little a quick look at what uh, the definition of partner is. Um, for I look, I went to Merriam-Webster, trusted resource, and one definition is a partner is one who's associated with another, especially in action. And I thought that definitely fits our care partners, taking action, being involved, caring for the person who is living with Parkinson's disease. 
The second definition is a person with whom one shares an intimate relationship, one member of a couple. And certainly that couple could be a spouse. But also I think when we're talking about care partners, there's all kinds of ways and configurations of what a couple is in terms of care partnering. We'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Another definition is either of two persons who dance together. And, you know, I like this. It's rather poetic, but I have to say I have a care partner that we work with, that I work with, who talks about the rhythms, how rhythms have changed in her relationship with her spouse who's living with Parkinson's disease. And it really has become in many ways a dance. Oftentimes, who's who, some lead, sometimes there's a lead, sometimes there's a follow, sometimes there's a, just a new rhythm that um, that uh, can sometimes be challenging, but also can bring joy. And um, the last definition is one of two or more persons who play together in a game against an opposing side. And I often think of the teamwork involved in partnership, in partnership, um, not necessarily of an opposing side, but certainly working together to live well with Parkinson's disease. So I'd like to now talk a little bit about the path of the care partner. You know, Leslie talked about the journey that's Parkinson's disease, and without a doubt, we talk about that a lot at the Pacific Movement Disorder Center when we're talking with care partners and those living with Parkinson's disease. And I also, and I like to also think about looking at the path, and I think that's where we'll be spending our time during this session, the path of the care partner who's caring for someone with Parkinson's disease. Certainly it's a partnership. We'll talk a little bit about that in terms of the different configurations of what a partner is. The parallel process that's involved that with the two. So I can talk a little bit about the, thank you. Um, the, the path involves all of us completely, right? For those that are diagnosed, those who are living with Parkinson's disease, as well as the care partner, that it really is a mind, body, spirit experience. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The path is also, I believe, an opportunity to create a plan for wellness, not only for the person who's living with Parkinson's disease, but especially for the care partner. And the goal I feel is always living well with Parkinson's disease no matter what the configuration is. And to really always be reminded, just like this virtual conference is today, a reminder that there is a community behind you and with you empowering you. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the parallel process. So I'd like to, we'll just briefly talk about this. There'll be opportunities to, to, to weave that in um, as we go along. But I just want to introduce the idea for me, I see for care partners, this parallel process that begins at the pre-diagnosis of, of, of PD, the diagnosis, interventions, living with PD, the planning, the continuum. And it begins with the person who might be noticing some changes and the care partner is right alongside, perhaps concerned, reassuring, always beside offering um, information. Where shall we go next? How will we get the information? Having the diagnosis. What does the diagnosis mean for the person who has um, Parkinson's disease? What does it mean for the person, um, the care partner who's right beside? the daily ups and downs of living with PD, and then the planning. It is definitely a parallel process. And I think that these at these particular junctions in the journey are almost some of the, 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 the curves and the bends. And certainly the care partner is alongside, and we're hoping to spend some time talking a little bit about that. So let's talk about the invitation. Thank you. For the care partner, I really feel like this, hopefully this will be inspirational but also a reminder that there it is there is an invitation to live well that when i talk about the invitation i'm really looking about that looking at that mind body spirit experience mindful of your own health needs and wellness which, which sometimes can suffer um, considerably the idea of introducing and really nurturing a self-care practice and we'll talk about that 
And then I think also part of an invitation is a flexibility in problem solving, because I feel like we all come and we'll talk about this, the inner resources, what we bring to this very moment, all of us, particularly care partners, in terms of problem solving, what strengths do we bring? And sometimes along this journey, along this path as a care partner, it's important to be flexible. We'll speak a little bit about that. So now I'd like to talk about a plan for wellness. Thank you. So the plan for wellness, I think, is involved, and this reminds me of our of our press programs through APVA and the way we look, I think, at the, the life for those who, who are living with Parkinson's disease, that it's about this, these steps towards living well, education, resources, tools, lifestyle changes, engagement, emotional support, building our team. We talk about this almost daily at every opportunity to encourage those who've been diagnosed with PD. But I also think, and I will encourage those of you who are care partners, that when, when doctors are speaking, when physical therapists are talking, when speech therapists, when support group leaders, when anybody is talking about what is healthy and promotes wellness for the person who's living with Parkinson's disease. Please think about yourself in those moments. What education can I do I need? What resources or tools can what are available to me as a care partner? What lifestyle changes can I maintain? What's challenging to maintain? What do I need to change? How can I remain engaged? What's emotional support for me? How can I build not only our team, but my team? I think that's very important. I'd like now to talk about the Empowered Care Partner. And I'm really hoping, hoping that this session is going to really kind of summarize these four points that I see as um, critical and has been my great experience to share with many care partners on this journey and on their particular path. So I believe that the Empowered Care Partner is someone who navigates the road ahead. And it really is a navigation. There's so many things beyond our control. It is almost like a GPS, like a navigation, like on the on the ocean, how we navigate. There's so much that we can't control, but there are ways that we can navigate things that we can take control of. And I'll talk a little bit about that. That it's about riding the emotional roller coaster, the roller coaster that's real, and the roller coaster that can be ridden with a lot of self care and acknowledging that as well. Working with a changing landscape, I'm going to talk in those top, these top 10 tips that are coming up, talking about working with a changing landscape and planning. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about planning, both short term and long term. So I think it's critical both for, especially for care partner, especially for the person who's living with Parkinson's disease. So now I'd like to talk about those top tips for empowered care, the, the empowered care partner. So as I was thinking about this presentation today, I was thinking like, what are the top 10? That, is, that, that, that feels a little daunting because at any stage, at any part, there could be a different, different types of top 10 tips for you as a care partner. But I think if I did it in the broadest of ways, um, that it might be helpful. So I thought these were the top 10 tips that I think are important for this morning that we review, hopefully again, to be seen for you as an invitation. And I'm hopefully, maybe it'll be an opportunity to set an intention of self-care, an intention to think of yourself differently in this partnership. So one is know what resources are available to you. Two, learn to navigate the changes. Three, honor your own process. We talked about the parallel process. Four, do not underestimate the power of communication. Speak briefly about that. It's never too early to plan. Find balance. Move yourself up on the to-do list. Trust your instincts. Nine, watch the warning signs of stress, which I think is critical. And 10, remember you're not alone. So let's talk about the first The first. Um, tip, which is know what resources are available to you. And again, these are in the broadest of strokes, but I think it's really important for all of us at whatever stage, whatever part of this path, this journey we're on, that we find out more about Parkinson's disease, about more of what's going on, more of the symptoms, more of some of the behavior changes, more of what's happening with your care partner. But as a care partner yourself, find sources of information that are reliable, both locally and nationally. 
Explore methods of education that work for you. There used to be a time when we would be turning to books and articles, and now it's the it's like the information highway we have. We're so lucky, but it's also important that you can make those things fit for you. How do you learn? How do you best take information? In information, is it books, the internet? webinars, maybe YouTube little snippets. I find oftentimes that care partners have such a full plate that sitting down with a book, for example, might be overwhelming, but listening to a 10 minute um, a piece on YouTube and self-care or about behaving, behavioral changes with PD, something that's easily um, digestible um, can be just right. And so I encourage you to think about what fits, what might fit for you. I always say, be, beware of Dr. Google. Um, it, many of the care partners will find something will, will strike them and they'll get on Google and start looking around. And it can oftentimes lead to sometimes misinformation, but sometimes a lot of anxiety. And so I just caution to beware of Dr. Google mm -hmm. and please pace yourself. You know, think about what it is. If you are looking at information and you're finding that you're feeling overwhelmed, please take that as a cue. Begin to listen to yourself. It may indeed be overwhelming. So it's okay to stop. You don't have to take it one giant bite. This really is a journey and it's okay to pace yourself. In fact, it's important to find out about what community resources are local to you. And again, these are very broad strokes. I'm just going to touch on them because I want to make sure we get through the slides. That there are local chapters, look into them, senior centers, what services are available. I know yesterday I participated in the conference, completely blown away by the wonderful presentations that were done on the importance of dance and movement and singing and um, all kinds of engagement, Think resources that are important for the person who is living with Parkinson's disease, but can also be equally important to you. I have a care partner, um, several care partners actually, who are engaging in ping pong and dancing for park with Parkinson's um, that do it together and find that it's such a rich, rich experience. Not only is it something that they can do together that feels good and nourishing, but they find that they have peers, they're meeting other care partners, and they're really forming different forms of community. It's really lovely. So look, look at, see what's around and what's available, things particularly in this conference that have uh, maybe caught your attention. And I can't say enough about the importance of connection to others. Both uh, some care partners talk about use Facebook pages, particularly for care partners. There's blogs, the personal connections that you have, and of course, support groups. And I really want to encourage you that if you have personal connections, um, one of the invitations would be to make sure that you maintain those, even though it feels might feel hard at times. And the last is remember that you are a valuable resource. Um, it's really important. Oftentimes we're looking out here to the resources that we have. And I think particularly for care partners, it's important for us to take a look at the inner, inner resources and what you bring, the strengths you bring to this partnership. Let's talk a little bit about navigating changes. I think it's really important to navigate the changes and so much can change with the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, health status, the symptoms change often from sometimes morning to evening things change. Um, for care partners specifically, it can be a level of awareness of change to sometimes a vigilance to sometimes a hypervigilance. Like there's a lot of change, a lot of things to navigate. Sometimes expectations of change, the person that you're caring for and with, and also of yourself. What's changing? What are the areas that I get exhausted? What can I expect of myself? How do I need to, how do I need to be mindful of these things? There, I often think of all of this as moving targets. So it's impossible to do anything perfectly, but to just have an awareness and to be able to look at what's on the landscape and realize that change is part of a new normal. The communication can also change, and I'm hoping will change. It will, there'll be a, a further slide about in, enhancing communication and the importance of communication. Sometimes roles shift for a care partner, and certainly relationships can change. But I think it's the important thing is that the, the word navigate, it's not necessarily that we have to gain control, that things need to be necessarily different, but that we can move and navigate through these changes. It's empowering. One of my care partners says we are map makers. And I think that's so fitting because as the landscape, and we talk about this journey that, that, you're, that you're on, that we're on, that it can be so different by individual that oftentimes the maps are very particular, like a thumbprint to you and your experience.
So it's important to navigate, learn to navigate those, um, those changes. Let's talk about honoring your process. I think important, it's so important when we talk about that parallel process that you're on, that as a helpmate, as someone who reassures, as someone who's there as a care partner, that you're also honoring your own process in this. What is your personal experience? Um, I would, I'll start with a quote. Many friends, this is from a care partner, many friends and family come up to ask me, how is Joe? How's Joe doing? But no one asks, asks me how I'm doing. I feel invisible when they ask me, and I feel selfish wanting them to, to kind of check in with me at the same time. And I think that speaks to um, the challenges of a care partner, the, this parallel process. And I think it's equally important for you to honor your process as you honor the person who's living with Parkinson's disease. So what do the changes mean to you? How do the changes impact your life? If this, is a, this, is, this impacts the family without question. Do you give, a, give yourself room? Do you allow yourself to feel? which sometimes can be frightening, but the anger, the fear, the sadness are all normal and all, are, are all part of this. Sometimes there's joy. Oftentimes care, care, care partners will talk about the gratitude that they have. Build on your strengths in this process. Resilience, your resilience that brings you to this moment should not be discounted, right? I really encourage you. All that you bring to this moment is all that you bring to this moment and it is a bucket of strength and a bucket of support. So please honor that. And I think it's really important at this particular point to be more attentive to what you may need now. And often care partners will put themselves last on the list. We'll talk about that. But it's really important for you at this particular point, in beginning, middle, further along in the journey, to really be attentive to what you might need. It's okay. We all encourage that. Let's talk now about the power of communication really think it's important to not underestimate the power of communication. And I think really, you know, we talk sometimes there's a, a program called Powerful Tools for Caregivers, Care Partners, but communication is a power tool. And the communication could be between you and the, your partner, the person that you're caring with, caring for. It could be with family, with friends, certainly with your healthcare team, and certainly with service providers. But I want to say and really invite you to think about communication as a way to facilitate understanding. And it's not only about the person who's living with Parkinson's disease, but what about you? What can you communicate about what you need? And this may sound foreign to many, but I'm going to invite you to think a little bit about that. What needs might you have? What concerns of yours need to be voiced to the person that you're caring with, the person who's living with Parkinson's disease? Your family, friends, how can they help? What about your healthcare team? Where are they falling short? Where are opportunities that you want to say more? And how can you say more and have time to say more, as well as service providers? It's, I think it's important to talk about, to communicate expectations. I think it's also important to say what's going well as well as what needs to change. It's okay to say, you know, we really did that well. We worked, we were able to get out of the house in a timely manner and make our ping pong match. We really worked as a team. That's great. And, and, and communicate those things. Sometimes one might call those micro communications, but I think in a care partnership, that those kinds of communications are important. And certainly I'll just put in a plug that, that if you are, um, that if you're struggling or these are things are, are, that you would like to try, that there's many of us out in the community who would be happy to facilitate that kind of communi communication. And certainly it's about sharing communication, communicate, communicating with each other. Let's talk a little bit about planning. I really feel like it's never too early to plan. And sometimes we talk about it's never too late to plan. But I think from a care partnership, just want to briefly touch on this, that it's never too early to plan, that exploring what might be next. And again, not with the eye of far, far down the journey, far, far down the path, but sometimes it's just keeping up and planning and thinking about what might be next, what might be coming ahead on this process. So I think it's really important to think about health decisions, durable power of attorney for healthcare and those kinds of decisions. Thinking about a financial checkup, where do you have strengths? Where are you um, have your concerns? 
What are the care options? It may not fit right now, but what are the care options? If you're involved in any 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 um, Parkinson's disease community, you're already hearing what's out there and what people are coping with. Take that in. Keep a note of that. Keep um, Think often and planning about engagement and support. And sometimes for care partners, it is about planning. So I like to think of planning in three phases, the pre-planning phase where you're exploring and kind of information gathering, keeping your ears open with others who are having conversations about uh, PD and, and how they're, they're coping and what they're coping with. There are short-term plans that are, there is a definite identified need. You might need help or assistance, fact-finding to that. And then I say that there's long-term planning. It's never, never too early to start thinking about these things, um, and it's important. So I um, wanted to review that. Let's talk a little bit about finding balance. So I have here a care partner, another care partner quote. She said, I found myself over caring for my husband and under caring for myself. And um, I think no truer words. I mean, it's really, really poignant. And I think of those marbles. I think of life for a care partner as a jar of marbles with all the responsibilities, all the changes, all the feelings, all the uncertainties and the unknowns as all those marbles. And sometimes as a care partner, you might say, well, where do I fit? And just like pouring water into these jar of marbles, a care partner will fill in between those. And I want to talk to you about finding a balance for you and making room for you, not only in between them but legitimate room and space for you. I think that finding balance is really a practice and it's going to be a personal one. And we often sometimes we think it's a mindfulness practice. It's um it, you know it's a practice of taking breaks absolutely and I think sometimes it's just a matter of giving yourself space and being kind. Making room for you, I talked about that. Making room not just fitting yourself in but making legitimate room for yourself. It will be ongoing. It's a balance. It's like, you know, it's really like this, you know, when it and, and because the landscape changes, the balance can change. And it's easy for the balance to get out of out of out of balance. And so it's important to say that there's really no there there that this balance is always going to change, that that's normal. So it becomes a practice. So it's important to explore what works for you and really celebrate the joys of the day. If you can, it's really important to mark those important, those small victories, those big victories for you as a care partner. Let's talk a little bit about moving up on your to-do list. So um, this is something I talk with my support group members about the care partners um, that I speak. I talk about moving up on your to-do list because I hear care partners often, they either have a written to-do list or they have a to-do list that's in their head. And I, I invite you to take a look at your own to-do list whether it's written or it's in your head and add yourself if you're not on that list. And you might say, oh, no, no, no. Whatever I have to do is way more important for the person that I'm caring for, for my family, for, for the multitude of responsibilities that you might have. But I want you to think about what you need that never gets done. That's usually a cue. My care partners will talk about that often. Oh, I, I, I need to get this done. I need to get this done. It's usually in something that's involving them. Sometimes it's picking something up. Sometimes it's making a doctor's appointment. So keep track and consistently put that on the list. Please don't make it the last on the list. Let's bring that up a little bit. Put yourself on the on the to-do list higher and higher. Keep track and consistently move yourself up. Practice, practice, practice. Sometimes this is hard for care partners, um, but practice, um, not, not to perfection, but practice to progress and celebrate the movement. Another quote from a care partner. I used to think that self-care was an indulgence. Now I realize that I need to take care of myself, not only for me, but for my husband. I'm a much better partner all around. Um, so it's really important. And I have to say one important thing about the support group that I that um, I facilitate for the care partners is it's certainly a time to acknowledge and talk about some of the challenges, but the important is, talk, is, is also sharing the celebrations of when care partners have moved themselves up and how good they feel and how it really is a shared experience. Okay, let's talk a little bit about trusting your instincts. So trusting your instincts, and this is something I call this my rule of thumb, really. The care partners often will come to me or come to many of us and say, when will I know? Like, when will I know it's time to get some help? When will I know it's time to think about driving issues or finance changes or calling our doctor about X, Y, or Z? When will I know it's time to look at our long-term care plans and make some changes? Or when is it time that our family, maybe our family and friends need to know more, for example? So I really encourage you to trust your instincts. I think that when that 
question formulates in your mind, when you formulated that question, you've already seen things changing and shifting. It's your intuitive way of saying, saying that I acknowledge this as that question is formulated. So trust your instincts. It's an important way of um, being an empowered care partner. Let's talk now a little bit about the warning signs of stress. So I think it's really important to watch for the warning signs of stress and um, some of the warning signs, I think. And the first one that I hear often among care partners is they talk about feeling impatient. They talk about the guilt that they feel about being impatient and how uncomfortable it is for them. Impatience is a warning sign. So is increased anxiety, restlessness, having more fears as a care partner, perhaps feeling depressed. And it may not be a kind of depression that would you don't get out of bed, but it might be not enjoying the things that you used to, that's a warning sign. Feeling fatigued, starting to isolate. Oh, my friends are normally meet on Fridays for lunch. You know, today I think I'll pass on that. I'm just not feeling up. Starting to isolate, pull back from things that you used to enjoy. Changes in sleep and eating for you as a care partner. And self-talk messages. This is too much. I can't handle this. What's wrong with me? Those kinds of things that might formulate in your mind that you may never ever speak, but that you think and carry with you. And I want to say that these are the warning signs and signals that it's possibly time for a change, maybe maybe long ago time for a break, and it's time to implement some self-care. So I really want to, my message for you in these instances of these warning signs, I want to reassure you that you're as a care partner, when you have these feelings, when you're experiencing these thoughts, you are not falling short. Your body is flagging you and saying, there's something going on. Please pay attention to me. There's something going on. I, I might need a change. We might need a change. We might need a change. And um, th what's critical is only you can make this happen by acknowledging these signals and signs and then making some changes to act on them. So let's talk about the last, last slide. And please remember, please remember, you are not alone. No one has to do this alone. And I want to tell you that I don't think anyone can do this alone. You are a care partner. You're partnered with the person who's living with Parkinson's disease. You both live with Parkinson's disease within the family who lives with Parkinson's disease and with the community who's here to embrace you and support you. So when you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're having a hard time navigating, please reach out to family and friends. Not, it may not be that every family, every member of your family or every friend is going to be someone that is going to be a safe place for you, but please find those people and reach out. Find support groups and needed clinical support. We're here for you. It's not uncommon for many, many care partners to suffer from a clinical depression. It's real. And we're here to acknowledge that and to give you tools to help and to acknowledge and, and support yourself. Remember, you're not alone with the medical team. If there's things and concerns that you have, please reach out. Let them know. Um, we're, all, we're all eagerly here to support you. And without doubt, the American Parkinson's Disease Association is here for you. Uh, we're all here for you uh, to reassure you that you're not alone. So I'd like to end and uh, begin um, the, the Q&A with a, with, a, with a quote from Les Brown that I think actually is a summary. Regardless of what challenge you are facing right now, know that it has not come to stay. It has come to pass. During these times, do what you can with what you have and ask for help if needed. Most importantly, never surrender, put things in perspective, take care of yourself, find ways to replenish your energy, strengthen your faith, and fortify yourself from the inside out. And I hope the session has been helpful, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and answering your questions. I'd like to invite Rosa to come back on. Thank you, Sheila, for that helpful presentation and that very in important message um, that really summarizes um, the tips to be able to live on, on this journey and to have a good quality of life, which is so important. And, and the, the message that uh, people are not alone, we are here to help. Um, there are some questions, so let's jump right in. Sure. Uh, we have a question from Brian. How do you balance the integrity of the PT person with the need for sound decision-making? 
Oh, gosh, isn't that a great, that's a great question, Brian. Thank you so much for that. You know, I think it is um, kind of a combination of navigation and communication if we use some of the tips, right? I think that this is a time when you're talking about the integrity of the person that, you, that who's living with Parkinson's disease and making some decisions. I think that's really a time for you to reach out to the, your medical team as well to get input. Again, you're not alone. Use your team, gather information, and then be able to sit down if you can with the person to navigate, to speak about what changes might be necessarily necessary, what might be needed, um, and try it from that angle first. Um, sometimes um, decisions might have to be made um, separate, but we also always want to include the person um, and help navigate. So again, the tips would be, this is a navigation to reach out and get more information from, um, from um, maybe perhaps from other care partners, from other family members, um, and then have a, have, maybe have a conversation. Thank you, that's a good point. Thank you, Sheila. Another question that came in, how do you balance being a care partner and trying to manage your own self-care? I know you talked about a few of those things, but um, that's usually sometimes difficult for a care partner to say, you know, how do, how do I find time for what I need to do? Um, I feel guilty if I try to go for a doctor's appointment. What if something happens while I'm gone? What, what balance, what would you recommend? Oh, that's another really good question. And it does speak to the tip on finding balance. Um, and I think that I'm, I'm, I'd love to know actually very specifics, but in the broadest sense, it, it's it, in the broadest sense, I think that um, just like making a start in terms of that to-do list, like putting yourself on the to-do list. I think that many times as a care partner, some of the, the, um, the self-care that we're talking about, let me just say this, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make, I want to have an impact here. So sometimes self-care starts very much from the inside out. It's like that quote. So I think trying to make space for yourself to be able to say that, yes, as a care partner, I'm going to need this. This is something that, that is going to be critical for me and not only critical for me, for the person that I'm caring for. And sometimes it's a duo. Sometimes I, I, I'd say to care partners, you're good, it, it, it will, you will feel guilty because you're moving out of a very intimate uh, care partnership even going out to the store sometimes, but it's really important that you maybe feel the guilt and do it anyway, feel those feelings and do it anyway, it really becomes critical. So the balance might feel foreign and messy at first, but as you start doing more and more things, you start feeling replenished, you start feeling, oh, I have more patience. And I just want to give, to say something about leaving someone alone. And I think that that's really important. Again, it's one of those trust your instincts. If you're concerned about that, and certainly there is a balance. You, sometimes, you know, like the, 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 that quote, I'm over caring and under caring. And I think for care partners, oftentimes that balance is hard particularly because there can be such real challenges in terms of ba real balance of getting through. But if you can reach out and find someone who's willing to be available during the times that you do that, so you have a backup. I often talk to care partners and people with Parkinson's and say that sometimes the spontaneity of things gets, gets truncated um, when you're thinking about these things, but don't let that stop you from doing what you need to do for yourself in order to, to, to find things to do, to do things that you normally would do. I hope that helped. That's very helpful. And really um, what I hear you say, Sheila, is uh, start somewhere, take baby steps, take one step here, another small yes. step. It doesn't yes. happen overnight. It's a process. No, um, right. And uh, we have another question that came in. How do I cope with the fact that your expectations for the life that you'll be living in your senior years are no longer under your control. Gosh, that is a deep and real question. And I appreciate it because I think it touches on so much. And we talked about the changing landscape and certainly when any, when any one of us get any kind of a chronic health issue, it changes, it kind of changes everything. It doesn't have to change everything for the for the worse, but it certainly does change everything. And I often hear so many care partners and uh, people living with PD talking about, I thought these were supposed to be the golden years, but I don't think, and I, and I do have to say that 
my, my initial reaction is that, you know, it is a change. And with this kind of a change and this kind of a change in expectations, sometimes it is it does involve a loss and a feeling of sadness. And it's OK. I think it's actually important to feel that sadness. I think once you feel that sadness, acknowledge that sadness for you, maybe together as a couple and say it's not going to be that this way and really give a chance to grieve, to say, you know, this makes me so sad, makes us so sad. But what can we do? What can, what is there? So that doesn't have to be so, that, that, that change is, is um, heralds the absolute worst. Change can actually herald new opportunities. And I hope I have time. I'd like to give an example of a, a couple sure. that I work with actually, who have, uh, the, the husband has um, is living with Parkinson's disease and his care partner is, um, they're, they're navigating this together. And um, when they first started coming to see me, they were uh, terribly anxious, very depressed, very concerned about what's next, what could possibly be next. Over the course of this last year, they've been totally engaged. They've been seeing the, their movement disorder specialists. They participated in a press program. They become completely engaged in the community, um, ping pong, singing, um, all kinds of wonderful community events. And together they say, you know, we never expected this. And we certainly never would have wanted this, but this has brought us closer together and created a community. So I think acknowledging what's hard, what's sad, what the loss is, and also looking, balancing that out with what might be some opportunities that are hidden because of the loss. That's, that's a really good point. Um, I have another question that has come in. Um, I've been my husband's caretaker since he became disabled in 2019, uh, 2009. I was diagnosed with PD in 2020. Right now we're taking things day by day, but that doesn't seem like a good long-term plan. Any suggestions how we can plan better? Oh, thanks. That's another great question. Um, you know, I think that you're, uh, can I first just reassure you that the day by day plan is a wonderful plan. I think it's really, I, I just want to reassure you that 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 is a wonderful plan. And oftentimes we will talk about, you know, taking it a day at a time. We borrow that from other communities, take this a day at a time. Sometimes morning is different from night. Um, in many instances, as things change, the landscape changes. But I also want to say that, again, this is following your intuition that you're seeing that day to day is 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 working now. But I want to look ahead. And I think now would be the time to kind of implement that pre that, you know, the pre planning and the and the short term planning is start looking around in the community, maybe talking to other care partners and other couples and, and looking at what might be some options. Um, I think that you can, I, I would really encourage you to follow your instinct on that. Thank you. Um, another question that has come in, how do I find someone like you, Sheila, that I could talk to that can help us um, make a better plan, get connected to resources, to get to, connected to other people? Um, does every uh, center, uh, have a social worker like you because I'm not aware of that resource. How can I find someone um, like you that can help us? Um, oh, thanks. That's a great question. I, you know, I, I, my immediate response would be to uh, lean heavily on APDA. Um, I think that you, as a, that the 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 um, support arms reach out far and wide, that there is both a national support and also a local support. And certainly APDA through the INR centers and um, the regional centers, the, uh, there are uh, lots of opportunities to find um, uh, people like me who can both be advocates and, and supports. Um, I would ask your, um, the, your uh, movement disorder specialist um, I don't know that all of them have a support person like myself, but they certainly uh, would could as as a team member be able to help and identify. Um, and so I would I would my 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 fallback and default would always be APDA. And then I would ask I would ask my healthcare team, physical therapy, speech therapists, people that you that all that you're engaging with. And I hope many of you are finding these these resources. I use word of mouth and find, but I, APDA is always the number one. And then, 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 then moving out in terms of the ring of, of supports. 
Thank you, Sheila. And yes, we do have chapters um, that we can connect people to. We also have information and referral centers, uh, the one similar to what you work. And we certainly can connect people. They can reach us at our 800 number helpline that um, we can put in the chat as well. Um, uh, there is another question that has come in. Do you have any suggestions for approaching end of life planning and or having the other talk with adult children about finances, financial insecurity, or any other issues relating to the future? Oh, that's a great question. And I think um, a tender one. Um, it can be really challenging, but I think that, um, again, it speaks to some of those tips about navigating and communicating and, and, and planning for sure. Um, I really think that this is a really important time to, to communicate and talk to um, adult children, to other people who would be uh, part of a decision-making team and letting them know um, what's coming up and what's important. Um, what you're finding um, in terms of thinking about what would make you all feel comfortable in terms of, of planning. And I think although those conversations can be very difficult, I think they're in very, they're critical. And to be an, as open and honest as possible and to include as many people and many people of the family um, as possible in those kinds of end of life issues. Um, not only to review documentation and to, to discuss what, you know, it, it, it's up to the to the couple, it's up it can be up to the care partner in terms of who's comfortable and you feel comfortable with having present. But I think having as many people as possible to have some some difficult conversations and, it, and nothing has to be like completed in one day. But that again, like we start, you take these small steps, maybe starting to talk about it, letting people know that this is on your radar, that you're thinking about this, maybe making a plan to sit down around a table and have a conversation. Um, uh, and begin that way. Another question that has come in, um, important question, Sheila, how should caregivers deal with their periods of anger, anxiety, and frustration? I know you um, touched upon that in your presentation, um, giving yourself permission to feel these feelings that are very normal in, in um in the journey, in the PD journey, but how do you, how do, can caregivers deal with those periods of uh, maybe sadness, anger, frustration? Yeah, great question. I, you know, I really feel like the very first uh, uh, kind of line of defense, might I say, for care partners in this, is to really try to do as best you can to, to, to feel and get in touch with those feelings and not discount them or push them away or, or easily kind of um, give yourself a hard time about feeling those, about feeling angry, about feeling anxious. It really is what I would say par. It's part of this, you know, it's part of life as a care partner to feel anxious to be angry to have periods of sadness sometimes to be impatient for example i mean that's that's part of it to to, to be living with someone um, to be caring for them um, having your own fears sometimes sharing their fears about what's next so my is to acknowledge that and then to have the opportunity to share um, can be very, very helpful and very, very. One, it's kind of it's 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 it it, it takes away the the sting of the experience of those feelings. It, it and also the opportunity to share whether it's a another care partner that you know of, a trusted family member, a trusted friend that you can talk about it with, and then moving. You know, of course, trying to find a, a support group and others so that you can see that you're really not alone. That a lot of things that I think care care, care partners feel most perhaps bring some guilt and shame is something that most care partners are experiencing. So you're not alone. So I would share it and then, then find, share what you're experiencing, share what you're feeling, and then, um, and then try to find others so that you can see that you're not alone. Yes. That connection is very important mm -hmm. um, to others. Another question that has come in, how can I get my husband to accept that even though my condition is not bad at this point, he is still a care partner and to give him to get him to talk a little bit more about that experience for him. Mm, great question. And again, I feel like this is like that partnership. You know, we talked about the importance of communication and it really is important. And there's things that maybe and I guess that's what I want to say is maybe as a couple to be to make an assessment of how you all 
um, shared with each other, maybe deep feelings, maybe had to have critical or difficult conversations that I don't think that that has to change. It just might make it more challenging. Just be aware that now if this is happening. If you want to let your husband know that these things that, that they're there, you know, please be mindful that this is what I, you know, to have those conversations. And I think to have them as openly as you can, that would be my suggestion. If it's something that's new to the relationship, perhaps you want to find maybe like a, a, um, a social worker, um, uh, someone um, who has a, 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 a practice therapist who can help facilitate that that conversation can be very powerful. And it's important that, you know, I talked about communication as a way to facilitate understanding. And I think that's what you're asking. You want to be able to have a process where you can communicate and discuss with your husband to let him know what it is that you're experiencing, what it is that you, you're needing. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And that's important. So um, I would be as open and honest as you could be. If that's something that is um, daunting or uncomfortable, maybe find someone who can help facilitate a conversation. And it doesn't have to be like a big formal couples session or couples of like, uh, you know, well, suddenly we're in couples therapy, but it certainly can be the opportunity to facilitate really honest and real conversations. So I would not, I would encourage you not to sit on that because that sometimes sitting on that can breed resentment. Um, and, and sadness for those living with, um, for, li for those living with Parkinson's disease. Yes. Very I hope true. I've answered. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a good, good answer. And how do you know, someone wants to know, how do you know when it's time to transition to a more supportive community? I think this person doesn't, they don't feel that they have that sense of support and community. Uh, how do you find that? How do you know it's time? Maybe I should search elsewhere. What do I do? Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, thank you. It's another great question. So I would say trust your instinct. So this is this is exactly what I was talking about with trusting you. So you formulated the question. When will I know that this isn't the right community for me? My hunch is I would say to you, I'm you're probably gathering a lot of information that your needs aren't being met, that you're not quite satisfied, the expectations aren't being met, like something is missing, something so you're looking for something to change. So I would use that as a cue to start in maybe even in that pre-planning of starting to look around and explore what other options are available. Are the other options that are available uh, a better fit, for example? Um, that would be one. Another, if you're living in a community and you're feeling like it might not be a good fit, um, if, is there someone within the community that you can speak to? And I don't know if this is if you're talking about supportive housing or you're talking about a bigger community, talking to 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 people. If it is like a supportive housing that talk about people that, you know, what you need. I think it's really important for whether you're living with Parkinson's disease or whether you're a care partner, that if needs are getting are, are, are that the services are missing the mark in some way that we engage, that you're, you feel empowered to be able to say, you know, and you're not going to hurt feelings. Like we're all here for you, you know, like, Oh, I, I need a little bit more time here. Or I'm feeling like this is this need. Is that something you can provide? If you can't provide, can you help me find a, a, a maybe a better fit for me? Um, yes. So I would start with one acknowledging that and following your instinct Take a look around, see what other options there are. Are there other people who can be critical in terms of, of exploring resources and being support while you explore those resources? Perfect. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful um, suggestion, Sheila. So thank you, Sheila, so much for all and also all that um, joined us today for this thoughtful conversation. If you had a question that we didn't have time for, feel free to su um, submit it at Ask the Doctor Community Board, and we will get back to you there. We also love to know what you thought of this session, so please click the rate the bu button at the bottom of your screen to provide us with feedback. We're taking a quick break. Uh, don't go far. We'll be back in a few minutes with some great breakout sessions, so take a look now and decide which one you would like to join. Thank you so much for being with us.